Okay, can you see me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, all right, so um, I'd like to start by uh, telling you a little bit about you know what we want to accomplish today. Um, first off, you know, people are begging to be understood, and if you've read David Kersey's book, you know, that's kind of what got me started in personality. Um, his book was... Um, Please understand me. Well, people want to be understood, and and that includes your customers because customers are people too, um, and they are begging merchants to understand and cater to their desires. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, as uh, Tony said, that I uh, I run a little business called Personality Marketing. Um, I'm been an entrepreneur and a businessman since 1994. Um, I'm also a rocket scientist. Um, and that's really my day job. Um, I, I run a, another company called Apogee Components, which I've owned since 1994. Um, but I, I, I also get into uh, trying to help others understand marketing. I'm a copywriter, an author, a blogger, and I actually do do inventions too. Um, and if you look me up on a patent search, you'd find out that I do have some inventions. Um, and I also wear the term salesman with pride. I know a lot of people don't like salesmen, um, but I do. Uh, my personality style, um, a little bit about me, I'm not a funny guy. Um, and as I get into this talk, you'll, you'll understand that. I don't have a lot of jokes. Um, I don't have a lot of captivating stories about relationships either. Um, if you're looking for that deep connection with with me, it's probably not going to happen. Um, not that I don't want it to happen. It's just that I kind of keep myself at a distance to others. Um, I don't have a lot of fancy graphics, so if you need to stay awake um, and you're looking for this as an entertainment, um, it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but I won't waste your time. Um, I am pretty direct. I, uh, I speak my mind, um, and I, what I'm trying to do is trying to teach a pretty complex subject of, of marketing and sales. Um, and I guarantee that this will be something new and that you haven't heard before because I've never heard anybody talk about what I'm going to talk about today um, because it's so powerful. Uh, my quirks, I say um a lot, as you probably already heard a thousand times. Um, that's cause, because I'm an introvert. Um, my brain has to reprocess the words that my ears hear, so I have to pause a little bit, and the um kind of fills in the space around me. And, it, you know, it's kind of like on radio. They can't have a dead microphone. So I say um, and that keeps my microphone going. I'm also a pretty controversial guy. I'm, I'm very biased and I speak my mind. And because of that, I often get in trouble for what I say. Um, what people say about me, um, people say that I'm arrogant. Um, and the reason is because I'm going to make some radical claims about people with seemingly very little evidence to support it. But as we go through this, you'll see where the evidence comes from and how I can make these radical claims. Um, because I don't have superpowers, but I can, I can kind of predict what people are going to do. Um, and I have a very keen ability for observation, coupled with a logical thought process. And if you know Myers-Briggs at all, you'll, you'll realize what I'm talking about is I'm an ISTJ. And all of those were traits of an ISTJ, which I am. Um, so with that said, I want to give you this disclaimer. Um, what I'm about to show you has not been endorsed by any organization. I'm speaking for myself. Um, so when I get in trouble, you can blame me and not APTI or any other organization. You probably won't believe a fraction of what I uh, tell you today, uh, but I'd like to you to keep an open mind. Um, you know, and if anything else, you can view this talk today as what crazy people think about personality. You know, I, I don't mind being called crazy. 
So what I'd like to start out is with a quick review of the sales process to kind of bring you up to speed, make sure I'm not leaving anybody behind. Um, why do people buy? And you've probably heard these reasons before. Uh, people buy for features. A feature is um, like a physical description of an object. You know, I'm, I'm looking at a pocket knife here on my desk and it's got three blades. And each of those blades does a different thing. And the blades are a feature. Three is a feature. Now what those blades do are the benefits, what they do for me. And so a lot of people will buy products for their benefits. And people also buy products for emotional motivations. There might be some emotion connected with an object and they want to buy it to receive that emotional connection. And then there's people that buy for strictly logical reasons. Um, you know, you have to eat food, so you're buying food for logical reasons. And then there's people that will buy things for relief of fears. You know, they've got a problem and they want that problem to go away. And so that is a relief of fear problem. But the hard part is we don't know why people are buying today. Are they buying for their features, the benefits, the emotional motivations, the logical reasons, or the relief of their fears? How do you know? And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. Now, the sales process you know, is basically broken down into five different distinct phases, and these should be familiar with you if you've done any sales. Uh, the first part is rapport building. This is where you go out and you meet the person you know, you find out a little bit about them, see if you share any common interests. Um, you know, if you go to a networking meeting, it's all about rapport building. Uh, the second phase is the discovery phase, is now you try to find out what problems that they have that you can solve for them. Um, so you'll ask questions. Um, these are your, your value solicitation questions. You know, what's important to you when you buy a new car, for example? Then we uh, want to offer solutions, and usually those solutions are going to answer their values questions that we, that we uncovered during the discovery phase. Then we need to close the sale. We need to get them to you know, sign on the dotted line to say that they want to do business with you. And then finally, we want to cultivate the relationship. Um, this is turning a customer into a client. Um, and I have a, you know, for me, I don't like customers per se. I will like clients. A customer is only going to do business with me one time. I want to do business with them a lot of times. So I need to cultivate the relationship and get them to come back again and again. So who do people buy from? Um, and this is, there's, there's generally three criteria on who people buy from. And it's people that they, that they like and that are like them, people that they know, and then people that they trust. Now, you don't need all three of these to make a sale, um, but it helps. The more you have, the easier it is to make the sale. Um, people that are, you know, when you first start out in selling, my first sales job was I, was, I sold... Um, dinnerware, um, you know, fine china. And they, the, the sales trainer in the meeting said, you know, go out to your family and sell to them first. And why do you, why do you want to sell to them first? Because they know you, so they like you, and they know you, and they trust you. And because you have all three of those criteria satisfied, they're willing to buy from you. Which is the most important factor in the sales process. And remember, we, we talked about the five different phases. I would say the most important one is rapport building. Uh, with rapport building, you can satisfy all three of the criteria of like, know, and trust. Um, if you don't get past that, if you don't establish liking between you and the customer, or if they don't know you, or if they don't trust you, you're not gonna build rapport and they're gonna go buy from somebody else. 
So how does personality type fit in to all this? Basically, it shortens the time it takes to establish the like, know, and trust. I don't have a lot of time in my day to you know, develop a lot of rapport with people. So I need, I need a shorter way to do this. And, and that's where personality comes from because I, it allows me to understand the customer better. And so even though they may not like me, they can, I can establish that they know me and that they can trust me. And those are, those are big. Um, and I think that personality is the ultimate rapport building tool because it can be used anywhere. You can use it in face-to-face -face conversations with the customers. You can use it over the telephone. You can use it on your website. And you can use it in email in the conversation back and forth with the customer. Because whether you know it or not, your personality comes through. My personality is coming through to you today. But when you're when you're interacting with a customer, it comes through. It's it's basically shouting at a customer. Um, there was one study that showed that 90% of your personality traits can be uncovered just by the shoes you're wearing. But there's it's more than just your clothing. It's it's the people that you hang out with, where you go during your day, where you choose to spend your time, um, even your your physical. Um, facial structure re reveals your personality. Your personality is shouting at a customer. And, and if you're able to pick up on that as a salesman, you're going to do pretty good in sales. Uh, what is personality? I'll give you a little dictionary definition here. Personality is the combination of characteristics or qualities that form an individual's distinctive character. Um, you know, you could say that she had a sunny personality that was very engaging and then people would automatically know what that means. You know, she's somebody that you want to hang around with. Why do we want to use personality? And I alluded to this before. Um, personality allows us to predict the likely future behavior of prospects. And this is the scary part that people don't like. Um, whenever I talk about personality, people say, well, you don't know me. Well, I don't know your history, but I can pick up on your personality pretty quick. And other people can pick it up too. Um, you know, the, what amazes me is this is, this seems to be a, a trait that everybody has that they can pick up on everybody else's personality around them. I could walk into a room and I could ask you, you know, tell me about your, um, the personality type of your, of your father. And then they'll start describing their father. You know, I, I would describe my father as uh, he was a, a kind and gentle man, um, very energetic. Um, he loved being around people. Um, and uh, he, was, uh, he was a soldier during the war. Very, very courageous. Got, you know, was decorated with a number of uh, honors in the military. So you can see, you know, even though you may not know about personality type, you can describe somebody's personality. And you can and from that description you can pick up on on their personality. Um so personality is the best predictor of of somebody's future behavior. And the thing is, you don't need to be 100% accurate. I don't need, you know, when I'm going into a sale with somebody, I don't need to be 100% accurate to predict what they're going to do. If, if I'm right more often than I'm wrong, I'm doing pretty good. For, for example, um, if you go to Las Vegas, um, the odds of a casino being right in a gambling transaction is about 2%. You know, about 51% of the time they're going to be right, 49% of the they're going to be wrong in a, in a typical gambling game. And with that 2% difference, look what they've, they've been able to accomplish. They build these elaborate casinos, hundreds of millions of dollars, even into the billion dollars now that these casinos cost. And that's all about being right just 2% of the time. So if we can be right... A little bit more often than we're wrong, we have a huge advantage. And I think personality, I think it gives me an opportunity to, to be right approximately 80% of the time. 
You know, I'm not right 100% of the time, but 80% is pretty good. That's, you know, that's, that's a 30% advantage. So when we talk about personality, um, and this should be familiar with you if you, if you know type, um, in the Myers-Briggs system, there's, there's four uh, trait characteristics that they look at. Um, how people gain or lose energy, how they take in information, how they process information, and then how they react or when they react on that information. Um, that's the P versus J. But there's more information that you can glean from these, these four questions. Um, we can also find out what makes them comfortable or agitated, what they value, and what they fear. And that's all going to come out of the Myers-Briggs personality um, system. And, and we're going to talk more, not specifically about the individual types, the 16 types, but the, the four temperaments. And the reason is that people in the same temperament share the same qualities to a very high degree. All the people in the same temperament, they're going to be the same things that make them comfortable or agitated. They're going to share that amongst themselves. And they also share what they value and then what they fear. Now, this, this sounds a little outrageous right now, but let me dig into this a little bit. And I, and I think you'll see how we're going to get this information. Um, in the MBTI, as you know, there's, there's the introvert versus extrovert. Introvert is... This is how, how somebody gains their energy. Um, I'm an introvert, so I gain my energy by being alone. Um, it's like Superman. He needs his fortress of solitude to, to recharge his batter, batteries. Or the extrovert, he, he's like, um, like a solar panel. He, he gets energized by everything around him. Um, and then there's the, the S versus N, the sensing versus intuition. The sensing is how you take in information through your five senses. Intuition is kind of like a sixth sense, and it kind of overrides the, the basic five senses. Um, intuition, the way I explain it to people is, um, you know, like color. You know, a person with a, with a sensing trait will see the color red, and to them it's just red. But to the person that has the intuition trait, that color red means something. It could be a feeling of warmth. Um, and then there's the T versus F, the thinking versus feeling. This is how you decide your decisions. Are you going to you're going to base your decisions based on logic, or are you going to react as like or base them on to, as a as a gut feeling? And then the final one is perceiving versus judging. And the way I look at this is how or when somebody makes a decision. Um, a, a perceiver is somebody that makes a decision. They want to wait until all the information is available and make a decision at the last second. Where the judging person makes up their mind way ahead of time. So when they walk into a room, they already know what they're going to do. Um, where the perceiver walks in the room and they're going to scan their surroundings and decide what they want to do. And with those uh, eight letters, we get the 16 different archetypes. Um, and as you notice on the screen here, um, the ones in the top left corner, the commonality among them is they all have the SP in them. The ones on the top right have the SJ. The ones on the bottom left have the N NT, and then the, the ones on the bottom right, on the right side, have the NF. And these letter combinations are how I describe the four temperaments, the SPs, the SJs, the NTs, and the NFs. And a lot of other type experts do the same thing. And in fact, what they do is, instead of talking about letters, they'll talk about metaphors. Um, and we use metaphors to describe the behavior of people around us because it simplifies things. Um, here is a list of some of the metaphors that you probably have seen a lot of type experts use. Um, 
the NTs, like for example, in the uh, Kersey temperament sorter, he calls NTs rationals. Um, in the DISC system, they call those compliance. Uh, Linda Behrens calls them the theorists. And then there's other ones. Um, people use animals to describe the temperaments. Um, and then there's people that use colors. Uh, and to be honest, I don't understand how they chose their colors, but I think what they have is they have that intuition trait and the colors mean something to them. So a green um, NT means something. Um, you know, they can feel it on the inside. They, that color means something. Um, the question is, is, do these metaphors help you? And for the most part, I think they do. Um, none of these metaphors are bad. Um, you can pick and choose which ones you want to use. I, I don't use these personally, but I understand them all, and I, I, I'm able to cross-reference when people talk about them. Um, but the, the, the question is, do the metaphors help you predict how they're going to behave or what they value and they fear? Uh, do you feel that you know what drives the person and what their purpose is for existing? And if they if these metaphors help, that's great. Um, if they don't, I'm going to give you a new set today that I that that helps me, and maybe it will help you. Um, the, the the problem that I have with the metaphors, and I'm saying I'm, I'll say it again, they're not bad. Um, it's just the way it's a way to wrap your mind around how people behave. But it seems to me like every, when they talk about temperaments, it, it, everybody, every temperament is its own separate planet. And each planet is by itself, and they don't interact with each other. And when they do interact with each other, it's like Martians interacting with people from Venus. And they don't mix very well. But we're all human, and we all share the same DNA, so... Where does that come from, and how do you know how does personality link from one temperament to the other temperament? How are we all connected to each other? You know, basically, you know what ties everything together. And the other thing that drives me crazy is <clears throat> if you look at the percentages of of the population, it's not evenly split. There's a lot more SPs and a lot more SJs than there are the NFs and the NTs. It, it seems like it should be more random. It should be 25% in each category, but we're, we don't see 25% in each category. We see more SPs and more SJs. Why is this? <clears throat> so do these, um, do these traits have a purpose? Does personality have a purpose? Um, and I think it does. I think form follows function. There's a purpose to these traits and it links everybody together. <clears throat> and this, I'm going to get into some theory here and, and you may not agree with this theory, but I'll, I'll throw it out there and you can mull it over in your brain and see if it, uh, see if it resonates at all. So, let me let me explain what this means. Form follows function. <clears throat> let me describe an object to you, and you tell me what the purpose of this object is. Let's figure out what's what its function is. So the first the first clue is this item has a wooden shaft, and it's about twelve inches long. And fastened to one end of the shaft is a steel mass. It's a big block of steel. And the way this steel is fashioned to the, to the shaft is it forms a T-shape. Now the T-shape, the, um, the, the end of the T, you know, on the top corner, it's flat. It has a flat face. And the other end is curved downward and it curves downwards towards the shaft. And as it curves, the steel gets progressively thinner. And it also splits into two like a fork. Do you see this in your mind yet? One more clue. One more clue. <clears throat> on the opposite end of the shaft, on the wooden shaft, it's wrapped with leather. Okay, so 
I don't want you to tell me what the object is. I want you to tell me what it does. And this is pretty simple. What I was describing was a hammer. And the, what it does, what its benefit is, is it pounds nails into wood. So the purpose of this was, okay, here are the, here are the traits. From the traits come a purpose. Or if you flip that over, I have a purpose. I need to pound nails into wood. What object would I pick up to do it? So from purpose comes the traits. So if you were designing a hammer, you start with what you want to accomplish and you work backwards to create the object. So do our traits have a function? So, so somewhere out there, there's a purpose. And if we start listing the traits, can we figure out what that purpose is? I think we can. But what would that purpose be? And here's where it gets a little bit controversial. Um, so what, what I want to do is to step backwards into human physiology, you know, the structure of the human body. How did we, you know, come to the shape that we have? What was the driving force that caused Homo sapiens, which, we, which is what we are, to evolve so quickly? If you look at the fossil record, Homo sapiens evolved a lot faster than any other animal on the planet. Um, from, from 2 million years ago to 1 million years ago, our brains doubled in size. And then from 1 million years ago to today, it doubled again. We are rapidly progressing. Why are we progressing so fast? And what scientists think is what's occurring is it's because of war, because of conflict between our species. Um, and here on the screen, I've got a couple of web shots from uh, some of the websites that I've found um, that kind of add proof to this. Um, Basically, we evolved not just to gather food, but to fight one another for that food. And it's, and it's the conflict between each other that shaped human evolution. And, and I don't like this at all because, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a religious person and I do believe in God. And maybe God had a hand in this. And, you know, I won't, I won't argue that. Uh, but we... We have evolved to fight wars and to and to survive wars. We we have con we can control the entire planet. Uh, we don't fear bears. We don't fear tigers or lions or any other animal. We can control them. And this happened way in the past. And the question is: Is personality linked into this? Um, so, cause, because if you look at our bodies, our bodies have, have evolved to fight wars. Um, on this screen, I have a picture of uh, a chimpanzee hand versus a human hand. And the human hand, you'll notice, has shorter fingers and a, a longer thumb compared to the uh, chimpanzee. And that thumb is very muscular. And the thumb is actually an opposable thumb which means that you can take your thumb and you can actually touch the tips of your other fingers. Now, apes can't do this, but humans can. And what does, what does that allow us to do? Well, one thing, it allows us to hold objects like, like rocks and baseballs, or it can also allow us to hold clubs. And if in, the, in human evolution, this ability to hold rocks and to hold clubs evolved long before they discovered any tools. So our first tool that we uh, as humans probably was picking up a rock or picking up a club. And it was basically not only to gather food, but to reach out and to hurt somebody. It's, uh, it allows the opposable thumb is allows us to project our power outward from our bodies. 
Now, now Neanderthals also had opposable thumbs. And on the picture on the right here, we have a skull of a Neanderthal. And on the, on the, on the left is a human skull. You notice the uh, Neanderthal was bigger. And in the past, they were much bigger than the Homo sapiens. Um, the Neanderthals lived in Europe, and they were probably in Europe over 100,000 years before the Homo sapiens migrated into Europe. So we, here we have this it, a big brute, a brute of, a, of a species. They were taller than humans. They had bigger brains. They were muscular. They knew the terrain. They had all the advantages. They, they survived several um, uh, glacial periods in evolution. And then humans came in. And somehow, in a very short period of time, the humans pushed out the Neanderthals. It basically, we were the cause of extinction for the Neanderthals. So how does this happen? How does a 98-pound weakling defeat a superior foe? And there's no, there's no evidence that they've discovered yet uh, that, uh, that humans actually fought Neanderthals. Um, so basically, how did we ex extinct them? Um, and what they, the scientists theorize is that we did it the same way that we do it to apes now. We just deny them territory, um, you know, habitat destruction. We Somehow we just used up all the resources in an area and the Neanderthals didn't have anything to eat and eventually they starved themselves out. And then how did this happen, though? You know, because basically they're bigger than, than us. Um, Thomas Wynn and Fredericks uh, J. Coolidge, and they're from the University of Colorado, they're uh, anthropologists and they're, they're experts in the Neanderthals. And they discovered or they theorized that about 100,000 years or so ago, a genetic, genetic mutation or epigenetic event might have occurred in Homo sapiens that enhanced our executive functions beyond that of the Neanderthals. So what does that mean? Well, it means that somehow we got smarter than they did. Um, and, it, it was, and it was a lot smarter. Um, a smaller creature got smarter than the bigger creature with the bigger brain. Um, what they say, the, the executive functions theory is that humans somehow gained more understanding of their environment. And I think, this is my theory, is that this executive function was the trait of intuition. Um, these professors, they did a study on the personality type of Neanderthals. And, you know, how do you study the personality type of a, of a creature that's been extinct for 30,000 years? But what they did was they looked at the, uh, their, their habitat and <clears throat> they looked at the bones that they discovered. And one of the weird things that they found was an overabundance of broken bones in the upper torso of the Neanderthals. So how does, how does the Neanderthal, you know, how do they break their collarbone or how do they break, an, you know, the upper, upper arm bone or their ribs? And what they theorize is that the, it was the way they hunted. The uh, Neanderthals had, they had clubs and they had spears, but the way they used them was different from the way Homo sapiens used them. The, the Neanderthals would attack their prey. They would attack the bear with their, with their spear by thrusting. So they would get really up close and personal. It was very hand-to-hand -hand combat with bears um, or, or the, the woolly mammoth or the saber-toothed tiger. So they would, uh, they would just run up there and just start thrusting and pounding. And then the animal would fight back. And the animals generally are more powerful, and so they would break the bones of the Neanderthals. And that's how, why they, they think that's the way they fought. Whereas the humans... Uh, we were throwing spears at that time. We were throwing spears and throwing rocks, so we didn't get up close and personal with our prey 
like the Neanderthals did. And basically, it's, it's a way of thinking on how you're going to attack your prey. Are you going to run up and, you know, thrust at them, or are you going to stand back and throw something at them? Well, the humans, with, with intuition, you want to throw because you, you, there's a less chance of getting injured. The, uh, the other piece of evidence that they discovered is um, artwork. Um, the Neanderthals weren't very, very artistic. Um, when the, they did make some cave drawings, but they were very simple, and they were usually uh, a single color. Whereas the Homo sapiens in the exact same time period were making these elaborate art, artworks in caves and their burial rit rituals were very elaborate. Um, where the Neanderthals, when, when one of their members died, they just threw them in a pit and covered them up. The humans would um, place with the body a lot of beadwork and uh, religious symbols and other works of art. So you have this, and, and that kind of thing is an intuition trait. It's not a sensing trait because you're, you're projecting into the future. What would a person need in an afterlife? So the, the Neanderthals, if you were to describe their personality type, it would probably be the SP or the SJ where the humans had four different personality types, the SPs, the SJs, NTs, and NFs. So what this does it'll, is it allows specialization within the species. Um, and there is specialization in the species as that we can tell, right, you know, just looking at people. Um, first off, you have males and females. Um, that is very highly specialized, each with a uh, specific purpose in reproduction. Um, so specialization does occur, but does it occur also in your mind, within your personality? And uh, for evidence of this, um, I found this uh, image of these ants, and these ants are exactly the same um, in the same scale. Uh, one's bigger than the other, and it's not an illusion because one ant is bigger. Um, and the, the big ant has different personality traits than the small ant. The big ant um, is what they call a soldier ant, which basically guards the entrance to the, um, to the ant mound, and it keeps out other ants that aren't part of the colony, where the smaller ant is the, the forager ant, who goes out and finds food and brings it back into the, into the colony. Um, so, and they have unique personalities. The, the soldier ant um, doesn't do a lot of thinking where the, where the forager ant does. Um, so that it kind of relates to human personality um, and it shows that specialization does occur within different species. So can it occur within the human population too? And I think it does, and my theory is that our personalities help us to survive wars. And, and to, to, to increase that survival chances, you'd basically need four kinds of individuals with specialized talents. First of all, you need fighters, people to go out and take the battle to the enemy, to defeat them. And you're going to need a lot of them. If, you, if you're going to survive a war with another clan, you're going to need a lot of fighters. The second thing you're going to need is a, a supply chain. You're going to need resources. You're going to need farmers to produce field, ranchers to produce meat. You're going to need road builders. You're going to need teachers to train the, to train the soldiers. And how many of these people are you going to need? Well, you're going to need a lot of them. In, in a modern military, the supply chain greatly outnumbers the fighters. Um, in the Vietnam War, I was reading, only one in seven soldiers actually saw combat. So the other six were, were, the, were the supply chain. Um, and then you're going to need somebody that has 
some brains. Um, I call these people strategists. Um, you're going you're gonna to go into battle against another clan, but how are you going to do it? How are you going to defeat your enemy? Or if another clan is coming into your territory, how are you going to keep them out? And how many strategists do you need? Uh, you don't need a lot, but you need some really smart ones. And then finally, you need caregivers. These are the people that take care of the army. Um, and then how many people of this type do you need? Uh, hopefully your soldiers aren't going to get injured, so you're not going to need a lot of them. And then, and then one day, all of a sudden, this hit me. So when I was looking at the human, human population in the different percentages, I said, now these percentages, as you see here on the screen, they start making sense. You need a lot of warriors. You need a lot of logistics. Not so many caregivers and not so many strategists. And I think that's what we're seeing when we're, we're looking at uh, the human population and the percentages in personality. And it, what this does is it, it really helps bring everybody together. We're all connected to each other. We need each other to survive. Imagine going into a battle without any strategists. You know, your odds of survival aren't very good if you don't have a plan or if you don't have caregivers. You know, the, what makes the uh, modern U.S. military so unique is that we have the ability to extract the wounded soldiers and get them to a hospital within an hour. And that gives the soldiers a lot of comfort because they know if they get injured in battle, there's somebody there going to take care of them. And this gives them a drive to, to engage the enemy instead of running away from the enemy. So I also want to point out that each, each branch of the human army is equally important. No one, no one personality type is more important than another personality type. We're all connected even though we're different. And now, now again, I want to say, you know, the, the percentages of the population start to make a lot of sense if you view humanity as an army. And I also want to show, you know, these are your customers. These are the people that you're doing business with. We're going to be, we're going to be dealing with warriors and logistical people, caregivers and strategists. So that's the new metaphor that I want to give you that I'm going to, from here on out, this is what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about warriors who are the SPs, the logisticals who are the SJs, the strategists who are the NTs, and the caregivers who are the NFs. And I call caregivers, I don't call them caregivers, I call them morale officers because of the way they interact with the human army. Um, if you think about it, medicine, you know, we think about providing medicine as part of giving care to, to a battle. But in reality, if you if you go back in time, medicine is, is, is a relatively new invention. So what did caregivers give to the army before there was medicine? And basically, they only had three things that they could give them. And that was comfort. That was courage, to offer courage, because you can't have your warriors going into battle and then... Um, becoming fearful and then running away from the battle because what happens you know the, the army falls apart when it, when the uh, when soldiers get scared and they leave who's who's there to fight so the morale officers which i call them are there to give courage to the army and they also give conviction give the reason why it's important to go into the battle so with this new metaphor system, I think it gives us a way of looking at customers a little bit more and, be, and to be able to predict how they're going to make their purchasing decisions. So what I would like to do now is, is I want you to design for me a perfect warrior. If you, were, if you were playing God, what traits would you have a warrior? Somebody that was good, their purpose is to go out and to destroy the enemy. Well, first off, I would want them to be very athletic. I want them to be fast. I want them to be quick. 
because in battle you're only getting, you might only have one chance to swing your your axe. Um, you don't you may not get a second chance because the the enemy is going to be swinging his. So you want them you want your soldiers to be faster than they are. You also want them to be resourceful. You want them to uh, to take advantage of the resources around them and to use them in the battle. You want them to be courageous. You want them to have a lot of courage and to not exhibit a lot of fear. You want them to be loyal to their friends because if they're not loyal to the army, that could be disaster. You know, what if they uh, switch sides on you during the middle of the battle? Um, Now they're fighting you instead of fighting the enemy. You know, if they're not loyal, the battle's over. And, and they're thinking the same thing about the soldiers around them. They want to be loyal to each other. You also want them to be independent because you want them to, you want, you want to give them a goal and say, just go do it and, and allow them the independence to do it the way they need to do it and to get it done. And as you're designing these traits, Always ask why is it important to this temperament? Why, why would a warrior what? Why would they value independence? You know why would that trait be important to them? And from the perspective of an army, it makes a lot of sense. And if you look at these traits, these are all traits of the person that has the SP temperament. Um, for example, um, they are very resourceful. They the SP. Because they have the P, they make a decision at the very last second. So they don't go into a battle with a plan. They go into a battle with a goal, and then they change their plan to whatever resources that they have available to them. So here are some other traits of the SP temperament. Um, they have two modes of operation. In, in selling, this is very critical. Um, one mode is battle mode. When they're in battle mode, they're they're there to fight you. Um, and when they're typically when they're out buying something, they're in battle mode. But then they have an, another mode of operation. It's their party mode, um, because a warrior they're not in battle all the time. If you think about it, you know, when they're not battling, they're partying. And, and I was always wondering why they party so much. And the reason is, is because, because they're a warrior, they, they look at the future, you know, tomorrow I'm going into battle, so what am I going to do tonight? You know, and from that perspective, that makes a lot of sense, you know, because if I'm going to battle tomorrow and there's a good chance I'm going to die, I'm going to have a good time tonight. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Um, the SPs are also very interested in gossip. Um, If you ever listen to um, pop music stations, every morning they have the DJs on there. And these DJs are constantly talking about celebrities and celebrity gossip. And all of them have the SP personality type. And so what is gossip? To, To a warrior in battle, gossip is information. It's information about your adversary. You know, how motivated is your adversary in fighting you? And if you can ascertain that, it gives you an advantage. Because if you know that they're a pretty fearful person, then basically all you have to do is bluff and they're going to turn and turn and run. Um, so gossip to a, a person with the SP temperament is very important. Um, also, um, they are really into clothing as far in, in very high fashion clothing. The fashion industry is dominated by people with the SP temperament. And, and if you look at it, their clothing is their battle uniform. It's their, it's their, uh, their armor, you know, how they protect themselves against the world and how they want to, how they want other people to perceive them. And it's the same thing with uh, makeup. The warriors um, are heavily into makeup more than the other personality types. And I think this is is, is a throwback to war paint. Um, if you, uh, I like that movie Braveheart with Mel Gibson. 
And in that movie, all the uh, soldiers, they cover their face with paint. And it serves a lot of purposes. You know, it, 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 it allows you to distinguish your side versus the other side. It determines friend versus foe. Um, and it also projects an image of yourself, you know, that we're the big, strong army. And I think makeup plays into that a lot. They are also quick to react to a threat. Um, they have that P uh, trait where they, they don't react until the very last second. But when they react, they're really quick. Um, and they also like weapons um, that in, in, and stuff that nobody else has because that gives them an advantage in battle. If you have a, a new weapon that the other side doesn't have, it's a huge advantage. And so they like to accumulate stuff that nobody else has. They want to be the first person to own something. Um, you know, we used to call them technophiles, where they had the latest technology and the latest gadgets. Um, the SP ter temperament, they're the first ones to gravitate towards cell phones. And um, anytime there's new technology, they're the first ones to have it. And they also desire to make a huge impact in their surroundings. The logisticals, their purpose is to uh, is the production, management, and distribution of resources. And if you think of a farmer, that's a pretty good description of a logistical and their mindset. Where the where the warrior is offensive minded, the logistical is defensive minded. Um, think about it like planting a crop, like a, uh, like a crop of corn. Once you plant your crop, you have to defend that crop against um, other animals that want to eat it, uh, insects, and then you also have to uh, water it. Um, you have to protect what, you've, what, you're, what you're growing, otherwise you won't have a crop to, to harvest. They're always driven by a sense of duty, and they're always serious. Like I said, you only get one chance to plant a crop per year. And if you blow it, you don't get another chance until the next year. So it is very important. And they're also very down to earth folk. Um, they don't, you know, they don't need to put on the airs that a warrior type would put on because they're not going out there to engage an enemy. Some other traits are um, their fashion is very businesslike. They want stuff that lasts. Again, think of an army. When you're supplying your battle, when you're supplying the army with resources, you want those resources to last because you don't know when the battle is going to take place. So you want to be able to stockpile it. And then when you use it, you want it to still be good. So when they buy stuff, they want to buy stuff that lasts. They also have a respect for authority and they desire consistency. Um, consistency is really huge because... Um, it makes the production of resources a lot easier. If you can predict that you can drive the same road every day to work, then you know how long it's going to take and you can, de you can decide where your time is best spent during the day. So having consistency is very important if you're into producing resources. The logistical also sticks by their decisions. Once they make up their mind, it's very hard to get them to change it. Um, and the other thing that I noticed about logisticals, and this is very uh, politically incorrect, but logisticals, they tend to store calories in their bodies. Because if you think of what a calorie is, calorie is a measurement of energy. So, and you don't want your energy to to be dissipated. You want to store that energy. And where's the best place to store your energy where nobody can steal it? So if you eat your food and you eat your calories, nobody can steal your calories from you. And so unfortunately, um, because of this, logisticals, they have a tendency to put on weight. Um, and I'm on a logistical myself and uh, it's a challenge, you know, um, to, to keep weight off because, you know, my mom always used to tell me, and she was a logistical too, she would always tell me, you know, there's some, there's some child in India that's starving, so eat your food. 
you know, and the reference is that if you don't have that energy, if you're not storing that energy, you could be starving in the future. Um, then the third type is the strategist. These are the, the NTs. These are the planners for the future, and they're very goal-oriented. They, you give them a goal, and they will tell you how to achieve a goal. They're very pragmatic. Everything has equal weight to them. Um, they don't give more importance to one theory than they would another theory. They're very efficiency experts. They they will tell you how to get the most out of what you have because in a battle that's what you that's what needs to happen you um you you go to battle with the army you have but you don't want to use up your army by uh, by making everybody into a cannon fodder so you have to be very efficient on how you use your soldiers well, as i said they're also planners and they value open mindedness and open mindedness is um, the ability to take in theories and not reject them right away. Um, where, where logisticals respect authority, the strategists respect accomplishment. If you're the person that gets things done, you're the person that the, the strategists will respect. And one of their biggest fears is the fear of being misled because when you're making a battle plan, you have to have good information. And if you're, you're making your plan based on, on lies, you're going to fail. Um, and they also desire knowledge because you have to have information in order to make good battle plans. And even the tiniest details are extremely important. So when they, when they dissect something, they, they dissect it down to the smallest molecule. And, but another thing is strategists, because they fear being misled, they don't even trust other experts. Um, they're not going to trust me because I am not a person that has a pedigree that they have. Um, uh, strategists love to have a bibliography. If a book doesn't have a bibli bibliography to a strategist, it might as well be fiction because they want to know the pedigree of the people that are writing a book. And as I said before, they categorize everything. They live with lists. And they also value self-control because if you can't control yourself, you can't reach the goal that you're trying to attain. And as far as their fashion goes, to tell a strategist apart, is a, a, a strategist, they tend to pick what's clean. So they go to their wardrobe. They're not looking in for something in particular. They're looking for something that's clean. And then they, they grab what's clean and put it on. And, you know, if it, if it matches what other people are wearing that day, that's great. If it doesn't, who cares? Uh, Albert Einstein, um, who everybody knows, a uh, famous physicist, he would often go to uh, to parties with two different color shoes or two different color pairs of socks because they were clean. <laughs> uh, the, the final one is the morale officer, which I call them. Um, their purpose in the human army is to mend others, particularly emotionally, and to give them courage. Uh, morale officers hate conflict. It makes their job a lot harder, you know, because basically they're, they're doing the same thing over and over again. They're fixing people with the same problem, and it gets tedious. Um, so I can understand why they hate conflict. Um, as far as telling them apart, um, if you look at the fashion of a morale officer or the person with the NF temperament, it's often warm and soft and fuzzy. Um, and you, like, like the angel here, like big, soft, fluffy wings. They don't like hard edges, um, because that is too hard on them. Um, they feel they are empathic, that they can feel the feelings of other people and they are very relationship driven. So why would relationship be so important to somebody whose purpose it is to mend others? The only tool that they have is their words, 
So to make somebody else believe them, you have to have that relationship. You have to found it. You have the foundation of a good, strong relationship before somebody else is going to believe you. So it's a way of building trust. And they are very risk avoidant. They don't take a lot of risks, not at least compared to what the warriors take. Um, but they, they talk a lot about having a lot of courage. Um, here's another morale officer, another some more temperament uh, traits. They are group consensus builders. Um, they are seeking universal truths of harmony. They are more spiritual than the other, other temperament types. And they believe in word magic. You know, word magic is um, the ability to persuade others. If you had the ability to, to, have, to get two people to sit down and talk to each other without attacking each other and to get them to walk away with an agreement, that's pretty powerful. And that's what word magic is, that they have the ability to get two people together and just using the only tool that they have, their words, and to get them to agree on something is pretty powerful. And that's why they, they believe a lot in word magic. And they also value broad-mindedness. And this sounds very similar to what um, open-mindedness of the strategist type is. But broad-mindedness is, is, is where, where open-mindedness is, is accepting different theories. Broad-mindedness is accepting the theories from different people. So you don't reject the theory just because somebody else said it. A person that you don't like said it. And they are often advocates for other people. They want you, they, they want the army to include everybody because the more people that are in the army, the more that you can achieve. So now I want to talk about values because this is very important in selling. Um, values are things that you hold dear. You can have values of physical objects and you can have values of principles. Um, you can value your, your, your family, your wife, your children, your friends, your possessions. You can value that new car that you have. Um, it's just important to you, and that's all I'm getting at. Um, but you also have guiding principles that are your values. Um, for, and your, 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 these guiding principles are your identity. They are what define how you're going to react in the future. And if you think about it, if you know somebody's values, it's like mind reading because people only think about the things that they value, what's important to them. Um, and you'll, you'll often, when you're in a networking setting, you'll ask questions like, um, how many children do you have? And you ask that because you want to know what they're thinking about because what they value is what they think about. And it's the same with guiding principles. If you know what the, the guiding principles are of a person, you know what they're thinking about. And every temperament has their own values. Um, and you can predict a customer's values by knowing their temperament. And so how is that? Well, here's how I, my procedure and how to predict values. What would help me be more successful in fulfilling my purpose in the human army? So as I'm looking at people, I want to know what would make a warrior more successful? What would make a logistical person more successful? What would make a strategist more successful or a morale officer? Those are the things that, are, that they're going to value. Now this chart here, I, uh, I, I got off of Linda Behrens' website at uh, lindabehrens.com. She wrote an article um, called The Leading Edge of Psychological Type. And in it was this chart, and it, it shows the four temperaments along the top. And she uses different metaphors than I use, but it's okay. On the bottom are the different type codes. So the first column there is the SPs, and I call them warriors. She calls them improvisers. And you look at some of their core values. And I, and I picked this chart because I didn't want to... I didn't want it to seem like I'm cherry-picking values. I want to use somebody else's values to describe the different temperaments. So, for example, you know, here we have variety and skill for performance. Now, I'm going to take this chart and I'm going to rearrange it and put it into my metaphors. So now I have, I have warriors, logistical strategists, and morale officers. 
and I have the same values that she had in her chart down there in the yellow bar. And above it, we have the purpose of each of these temperament types. So if the purpose is to engage and defeat the adversary, why would variety be important? Or why would skillful performance be important? Because they allow you to swing an ax a lot better. The more ways you can swing your sword, or the more precise you can be with, with the swinging action, the quicker you can take down your enemy. And that carries over into today. So in making the sale, you, when you present your product in a way that will help them fulfill their purpose in the human army, you will make the sale. So if I present to a warrior person a way for them to be more skillful or a way for them to have more variety in their actions, they're going to gravitate towards that and they're going to buy from me. And the reason is it because it aligns with their values and their purpose. So write this down. Values are king. When you know a person's values, you know a lot about them. And people leak their values everywhere. When you ask somebody for advice, what they're going to give you are values. Um, like If you ask me for advice on, on uh, getting money, um, I'm going to tell you to work hard. Um, I'm not going to tell you to go rob a bank because robbing a bank would be against my values. Um, values are the guiding principles people consider to be the secrets of their success. Whenever you see an article or a book that has like the seven secrets of wealthy people or the, the 10 secrets of successful relationships, if you go through each of the points Basically, it's, 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 the, it's a value of the person that wrote that article. So pay attention to those secrets of success because they're really their values in disguise. <clears throat> now I'll get into instant rapport because when you share the same values with somebody else, you're going to establish instant rapport with them. When, when a person feels that your values match their values, they're going to like you. And you see this all the time in uh, political rallies. Um, you can go to a political rally and you can feel that everybody else there has the same values that you do. And you can go up to somebody who you, a complete stranger and say, um, I got to go uh, use the uh, restroom over there. Can you watch my seat and my belongings? And you can trust that purchase person to watch your belongings because they have the same values that you do. And so if people, when they, to, when they meet somebody with the same values that they do, it's like they're looking at themselves in a mirror. And they, you trust the person in the mirror because you know that person. You know exactly what they're going to do in the future. So, but there's a trick to revealing your values. One is that you must reveal yourself, your values first before the other person does. So when you're going to a networking meeting, you want to reveal your values before they do. Because if you don't, you, you appear to them as a me too man. A me too man is like you go, you, you go meet somebody and you, you ask them, do you like sports? Yeah, I like sports. Oh, me too. Uh, who's, your who's your favorite player? Oh, Peyton Manning. Oh, Peyton Manning is my favorite uh, player too. You know, and being a me too man People don't like it. They don't trust them um, because, th and this is value solicitation. And I don't, you know, and in sales, we're taught uh, we're taught to solic solicit somebody else's values. Well, when you're asking them their their values, they're gonna they're gonna distrust you because they don't know if you you're asking them that just to find a point of agreement or if you really do believe it. For us in personality, we have a huge advantage because, because values are connected to temperament type, we know their values in, ahead of time. So the only thing that you need to do 
is to type them really quickly when you meet them. Am I talking with a warrior? Am I talking with somebody from logistics, a strategist, or a morale officer? And once I know which type they are, I can go back to my list and, and look up their values, and now I can start feeding them their values. If I was talking to a warrior, remember, they, they like skill perform, performance. So, you know, you would say something about, you know, a skillful performance, um, and then they would, they would be more apt to trust you. Uh, but oftentimes, your values don't match. And when they don't match, don't try to fake it um, because people will see through the facade. As I said before, you're leaking values all the time, and, and people can pick that up. Um, it's like watching uh, John Wayne, the actor, do a movie doing martial arts. You know, John Wayne is not a martial arts artist. So for him to do that kind of, of performance, it would seem really out of place. And that's what happens with your customers when, when you try to fake values. They're going to pick it up. Um, but there is good news is that the, there are values that overlap in temperaments. Remember the broad-mindedness and open-mindedness? They're very similar. And so you can, you can overlap values without trying to be disingenuous. Um, the other thing is you want to reveal your negative traits first um, because people have already stereotyped people of your temperament and they, um, so you want to acknowledge those attributes. For example, um, at the very beginning of this webinar, I told you that People consider me to be um, very opinionated, very arrogant, um, not very funny. Well, what I was doing was I was revealing my negative traits to you. Um, and what this does is it disarms the other person because they already know how to deal with a person of those negative traits. For example, um, a friend of comes to you and says, um, let's go to uh, Bob's restaurant over there for lunch. And you're in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, I've been to that restaurant before. It sucks. You know, the, the last time I was there, they screwed up my food. But you want to go to lunch with this person and you don't want to hurt their feelings. So you say, yes, I'll go to Bob's with you for lunch. So why are you going to Bob's? because you already know how Bob is going to treat you in his restaurant. Um, <clears throat> you know he's going to screw up your, your food. So when you go there, what you're going to do is you're probably going to tell him, okay, um, I like my dressing on the side. Um, I only want a small amount and, uh, you know, and don't screw it up. So basically what you're doing is you, you, you're putting Bob in a box and you're, you're able to control Bob because you know his negative traits already. So when you reveal your negative traits to somebody, they know exactly how to deal with you. You're not going to fool them, especially when, when, when your traits show through. Um, <clears throat> so the example that I gave is, you know, um, as a logistical, I come across as serious and gruff. Um, and in general, that is correct. You know, I do come off as serious. If you're a morale officer, what is a trait? What's a negative trait of a morale officer that other people think about morale officers or, or the person with the NF personality type? Um, and the negative trait that, that comes to the top of my head is these people are, are enablers. Enablers allow people to get away with bad behavior. So you might say to somebody, I've been called an enabler, and it's probably right, is I do give people the benefit of the doubt. And as soon as you say that, people know how to deal with you. And they're going to, um, remember, it's, it's not, it's like know and trust. They may not like you, but they know you, and now they can trust you. It's like politicians in Washington on both sides of the aisle. They... They go out to dinner with each other, and, and it's not because they like each other. It's because they know each other, and they know how 
they trust, they know how the other person is going to operate. So you don't need to be the same personality type of somebody in order to do business with them. You just need to establish the knowing and the trusting part, even if you aren't of the same temperament. <clears throat> so that, that was building rapport. Now we're going to get into emotions because selling is very emotional. Um, and emotions are also tied to values. Um, you can trigger specific emotions when you know somebody else's values. For example, uh, happiness. You can trigger happiness in somebody else when you honor their values. You start with their values, and then how you deal with their values is going to determine what emotion is elicited. <clears throat> Say, for example, um, I, I walk up to you and I say to you, wow, you have the greatest kid in the world. What emotion are you feeling now? Is it anger or fear? Um, I can almost guarantee you that's going to be happiness. Um, another emotion that you can trigger in somebody else is fear. A fear is triggered when the person feels that something that they value is being threatened. If um, I threaten your children, you know, that's going to elicit instant fear. Um, if you feel your child is going to get sick or going to be taken captured, um, that is going to create instant fear. Anytime you threaten somebody else's value, it's going to create fear. And if you want to trigger anger, you basically attack their value. If I hurt your child, instant fear. If you got a brand new car and I park next to you, and I open my car door real hard and put a ding in your car, what are you feeling? It's because you value your car and I attacked your car, you have instant anger. And so what I'm getting at is the, uh, if you go back to this chart and you see, anytime you see the word stressor, those are actually fears in disguise. So, for example, I'm, I'm going to take this chart here on the uh, under the improviser. We have the con we have the stressors of constraint, boredom, and lack of impact. So, those are fears. So, what value was threatened to produce that fear? So, under the uh, uh, fear of constraint, what value would you threaten to trigger that fear? And that's a value of freedom. If I, if I threaten to take away your freedom, that's basically constraining you, tying you up. And then you have this fear. Under, uh, if I threaten variety, you have the, you, the fear, fear is triggered. And lack of impact, what value would that be? Skillful performance. If I threaten skillful performance, you will have a fear of lack of impact. So I cannot stress this important. This, this, this is so important. You got to write it down. Fear is triggered when a person senses a threat to one of their values. And anger is triggered when a person senses that their value has been attacked. And this, that's how people are manipulated. Um, let me let me show you anger here. So if the value is freedom, how would you attack somebody's value of freedom? And this is the warrior, because warriors really do value their freedom. Um, if you said something like, just do it the way I told you, it's going to instantly trigger anger in them. Um, to attack variety, you could say something like, you can't choose that one. Or you might say, keep practicing until you get it right. You know, because the warriors hate to have forced practice. They want to be able to do things their way. Under skillful performance, um, if you want to attack somebody's skill, you just say to them, you, you don't have much talent. <laughs> 
um, the instant uh, you say that, instant anger. So you do control the emotions of other people in how you interact with their values. Um, in selling, these two triggers of anger and fear are very important because they cause people to take action. It gets them off their butt and do something. Um, but anger is, is a little bit harder to use because you can't have anger directed at you. You always have to have their anger directed at somebody else. Um, because if I told you, if you were a warrior and I told you, you don't have much talent, what are you going to think of me? Are you going to do business with me? Of course not. So you got to direct that anger at somebody else. Uh, hey, Bob over there, Bob, you know what Bob said about you? Bob said, you ain't got much talent. So now do you feel anger towards me or do you feel anger towards Bob? Probably anger towards Bob. So what I'm going to show you now is kind of a, kind of one of my, my secrets here. This, this is, um, this is a very small chart of values, fears, and anger triggers that are really useful in selling. And these are just some. The list is very extensive because people have a lot of different values. Um, and, the, and most of these values um, you've seen in the chart that I showed you earlier. And I'm going pretty fast, so I apologize for that. But you might want to start writing some of this down because these are what you're going to use in advertising. Um, so warriors, they value variety, skill for performance, and freedom, which we talked about before. And they also value loyalty. Um, this is this is huge. I think this is one of their, their highest values is loyalty because they, they have this constant nagging fear of being stabbed in the back. And what angers them are traitors, friends that have betrayed them. They just absolutely despise. And if you watch any television, particularly any reality TV show, um, they always pick warriors on those shows because they're fun to watch. They, they're high energy. They, they do a lot of great things. Um, so that's why they choose them on their TV shows. But when, then once they're on their show, the warriors are always talking about loyalty. It's one of their highest values. Um, these are some values, fears, and anger triggers of the logisticals. We talked about security before. Um, what they fear is either a famine or a siege. Um, in those conditions, you're going to need to protect what resources you have. And what angers them is theft, people that take their stuff. Uh, they also value continuity. Um, and the reason is, is they have a fear of not being able to replicate resources. Um, being able to drive your products from one place to another place, you need consistent roads. You need to be able to move the, the products and services. And so what angers them is when they see social decay, when, when you tear down continuity. Um, they also value responsibility. They fear being dependent on others for resources. You know, for a logistical, they're the ones that make resources. They don't get resources from others. They make them. And what angers them are people that shirk, shirk their duties. And then they also value integrity. Um, they value integrity because in order to be able to trade resources back and forth, you need to barter. And if you can't barter, you have no way of making the exchange. So basically, you're, you're a redundant person. So they fear not being able to barter with others. And what angers them, which is an attack on the value of integrity, are cheaters. People that, that steal and, and skate the system. Um, here are some values of the strategist. Um, they value hey, Tim, progress. Can I just interrupt for one moment, please? Yeah, we're going long? Uh, yes, we are at about at time. Um, and in case anybody has any hard stops while we're finishing up, uh, we are recording this to send out to everyone. I wanted to check, would it be acceptable to send out the PowerPoint to everyone so they can keep up with the recording if they have to leave? Sure. Fantastic. Since I'm All going right. long.
Um, so, last thing, if anybody does have a hard stop here at this time, we're going to let Tim keep going and take some questions. Uh, if you do need to leave, just get in touch with me at info at aptinternational.org. Uh, we can get you the recording and the PowerPoint and expect the survey coming by email within the next day or two. All right, Tim, go ahead. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry for going long. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to fly through this as fast as I can. Uh, there's there's just so much good information here. Um, when you when you know their values, you have the ability to control their emotions and how they're going to react. Um, and and a lot of this, people will look at this as manipulation. And I don't. And there's a fine line between persuasion and manipulation. And my my definition is persuasion is when you're helping somebody for their gain. If you're helping somebody for your own personal gain, then it's manipulation. And I don't want you to use this for manipulation, obviously. I want you to use this for uh, helping people to improve their own lives. These are the ways that you get them off their butt and to, and to get them to take action. Um, the morale officer, um, their values, uh, these are just some of them, authenticity, empathy, harmony, and broad-mindedness. Um, it fears, they fear impurities because that is a threat to authenticity. Um, and then they, 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 they're angered at being called a fake. Um, empathy, they fear not caring and they are angered by insensitivity in others. They value harmony. They, they fear disunity because that it doesn't allow the organization or the army to act as one and to be more effective. And so what angers them is decisiveness because it is an attack on harmony. Um, under broad-mindedness, they fear missing opportunities for relationships because if you can't, if they can't create the relationships, they can't um, encourage and get the other person to be motivated. And so what angers them are narrow-minded people, people that are bigots, you know, homophobes, um, anybody that won't accept an opinion from another person because it creates disunity. So... Um, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up here. So in the five steps, I don't even remember those five steps from uh, earlier in the sales process. We had rapport building, discovery phase, offer solutions, close the sale, and cultivate the relationship. So now how are we going to use um, personality in this? So under the rapport building, what you want to do is you, you want to start out by honoring their values. Um, so so you'll you'll type the person. And from that, you'll know their values, and then you honor those values, and that's going to create happiness. They're going to be, they're going to like being around you. Um, and then to develop deep rapport, basically you want to trigger anger, but you want to trigger anger at people that don't have the same values. You know, it's the old saying: "The enemy of the, my enemy is my friend." So if uh, if you're, you're talking with a, a morale officer and I said that they don't like narrow-minded people, you'll want to point out other people that are narrow-minded. And basically what you're doing is you're, you're telling them, you're revealing your value that you also value um, inclusiveness, which is one of their values. And um, like I said before, when, when your values match, you're going to have rapport. And when, what, what you're angry at and what they're angry at is the same thing, you're going to have really deep rapport. In the discovery phase, what you want to do is ask questions about potential threats to their values. This is going to trigger some fear in them. For example, if you're selling a car, you might say, um, you know, you're going to be driving around with your family um, how important is safety to you? You know, especially if you're 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 talking to a logistical person, because safety is important. You know, security and safety is important. So you want to trigger some fear by asking the right questions. When you offer solutions to a person, 
you want to show how they'll be more successful fulfilling their purpose in the human army, how buying your product fulfills that need. Um, you know, for, for the warrior, um, you know, they want to be impactful. That's one of their values. So if you're selling them a car, you would, you might want to say something like, you know, to be more impactful, um, this car right here is really going to get you noticed with your friends. You know, that gravitates towards their mind. And then when you go to close the sale, if you need, if you, if typically by going through those, those three steps first, there's not going to be a lot of resistance on closing the sale. Basically, you could just say, buy that product right there, and they'll say, okay. But if they don't, then what you need to do is to trigger a fear, um, which is a threat to one of their values. Um, and then also hint at failure to be successful in the role in the human army if they don't buy now. You know, if you don't buy this car now, you're talking to a warrior. You could um, you could say something like, if you don't buy this car now, you know, what are your friends going to think of you? You know, you're playing off of being impactful and um, the loyalty. Those are both high values for the warrior. And then under cultivating the relationship, um, as I said before, we want to create clients. We don't want to just have customers because customers just buy one time, clients buy again and again. So when you're talking about cultivating the relationship, you want to honor their values for the friends that they have because you basically want to get testimonials and endorsements from, from them that you can use it to get your foot in the door with other clients. So you want to honor the value that they have for their friends and you'd like to know who it was that helped them to be more successful. You know, you're, you're, if you're selling office supplies, you could go to the person and um, it's particularly if they're a morale officer, you could say, uh, who helped you get to where you are today? And they will list somebody that they feel is very important. And now you have somebody that you can call upon um, and then um, reference this person that you're talking to today. So that's basically how you incorporate personality into sales and marketing. And here, under a quick review, um, the purpose of humanity is to fight and survive wars. Particularly, you want to survive. You, you know, nobody wants to fight, but if there's going to be a war, you want to be able to survive. And in order to survive, we have the human army. And each in that human army are four temperaments, four types of people, warriors, strategists, logisticals, and morale officers. Each of them has their own personality traits. And from these traits come their values, or actually their values come first, and then their personality traits flow out of their values. And once you know their values, you also know their emotional triggers. What will trigger them to be happy, what angers them, and what causes them fear. So what you should do next, um, learn the traits of the four temperaments. I gave you just a short list today, but you know there's a lot of information about out there on personality types. There's a lot of different personality systems, as I talked about before. There was the Kersey uh, temperament sorter, um, the DISC system, Linda Barron system, the true colors. There's a lot of information out there. Um, they're all going to list traits of people. Get those traits, know those traits, and then use them to learn to type read people so that when you meet somebody, you can pick up instantly which of the four temperaments they would fit into. This is pigeonholing people, and I admit that, and a lot of people don't like to be pigeonholed, but um, when you can categorize people into one of those four temperaments really quickly, um, now you can go back to your values chart and say, what values does this temperament have, which gives you um, strategies that you can use to persuade them to buy your products. Um, so remember to match the values with temperaments. Um, so that kind of concludes what I'm going to say, and uh, we're going to open it up for questions right now. Um, but I'd, I'd like to ask a favor, and that's um, that you email me a testimonial 
about what you learned in this temperament uh, webinar today. Because um, I, I do have a business and I, I honor your <laughs> I honor your your opinions. And um, I I know there's a lot of people out there that respect you. And I would like to go out and try to persuade them to do business with me because uh, I'm also a, a coach and a, uh, a marketing professional. And I'd like to uh, offer them some some information. And you can send that to me at Tim Van Milligan. And my email is tvm at customersecrets.com. Um, customersecrets.com is also my blog site where I do blog a lot. Um, I haven't blogged recently because I was getting ready for this uh, webinar. Uh, but there's a lot of good information there from, from the past few years. There's a lot of good information on uh, how how the temperaments interact with each other, which is really critical. You want to know what other people think of you. Um, and if you're interested in more information, um, I do have one product on my website, and it's called the Personality Marketing Manual. Um, it basically is a, it's a set of series of CDs and DVDs where I discuss the four temperaments and give you information on how to type people 